Father, I see that you are drawing a line in the sand. I want to be standing on your side, holding your hand. So let your kingdom come. Let it live in me. This is my prayer. This is my plea. Father, I see that you are drawing a line in the sand And I want to be standing on your side oh. Well, tonight we are going to talk about the Feast of the Lord. Uh, we are going to talk about all the festivals and the holy days that are found in the Bible. We're going to talk about God's whole, uh, calendar and what it means uh, versus our calendar. And uh, we'll discuss uh, by the end here we will have gone through all of the feasts, all seven of the feasts, and basically done an uh, do an overview. So this is not an in-depth uh, study on the feasts. For some of you, you will already know all of the information here. You may pick up a couple tidbits. For, for others, this will be brand new. Uh, so no matter where you're at on, on the spectrum here, we want to create a, uh, a situation where, where everyone um, is edified and, and kind of growing at the same time. So we're going to do just an overview of the feast, and then as time allows and as the Lord allows, we're going to go into detail uh, of each feast at a different date uh, on, on all the levels, because how many know that as you get into the scriptures, it, it can just infinitely uh, go deep. There's so many different things that, that we can learn about each individual thing. So the feast of the Lord, prophetic rehearsals of the second coming, okay? And that's really what this is. It's all the rehearsals of the first coming and the second coming of the Messiah. So here's some questions that we want to ask. Number one, why should we study the feast anyway? Number two, aren't they Jewish and given only to the Jews? And number three, what significance do they play in my life for today and in the future? Okay, so we want to find out what these are all about because I mean, what do we even need to know about these four anyway? I mean, if, if, we're, if we're going along and we have a relationship with the Lord and you're saved and you know that the Messiah is coming back and you believe in Jesus, what do we need to be doing all the, you know, why do we even need to know these things, okay? We're going to answer all these questions as we move through here and hopefully you'll have a little bit more uh, of an idea, a little significance about some of the things that we're going to be talking about. These are the seven holy days, the seven feasts of the Lord. The ones that are in green are the spring feasts, okay? And the ones in, in the orange, uh, orangish red, are the fall feast. And then you have uh, number four, Shavuot, that's stuck in the middle. So let's just go through these real quickly. The first one is Passover. The second one is unleavened bread. Most of you are very familiar with these first three. And the third one is first fruits. And then the fourth one, or the spring feast, really culminate into the summer feast of Shavuot. Uh, in Hebrew and in, in Greek, it's called Pentecost, and most of us are very familiar with that. The last three are the most significant of the feasts, which we'll be spending a, a, you know, a little bit significant amount of time near the end here, because they all deal with the second coming of the Messiah. And everyone wants to know when the second coming of the Messiah is going to be. Okay, I haven't met anybody yet that doesn't want to know when, when, when the Messiah is coming back. But I can assure you that just like in my own family, that whatever my wife has on her calendar, that is the real calendar, okay? I have my calendar, uh, but she has her calendar, and her calendar is the calendar, okay? So I think Yahweh kind of works that same way in the fact that He allows us to have our own calendar. And He's okay with us having our own calendar, but understand that His calendar trumps our calendar. Would you agree with me? Okay? So no matter what His calendar is, I think it's very important that we start off understanding that his calendar is the only one that counts, okay? All right, so that's important for us to go through. So the fall feast, or Rosh Hashanah, or the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, and Sukkot, okay? Or Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Ingathering, okay? The end of the year, Thanksgiving, so to speak, okay? All right, so let's go through and, and, and work through this, you know, one question at a time. First of all, aren't these just for the Jews? How many have heard that, that the feast days of the Lord, these are Jewish feasts? Why would you want to celebrate a Jewish feast, David? Why would you want to celebrate, you know, a, a Jewish holiday? Now, what's, what's strange about that statement is it's completely without fact. So the two things that we want to live by, and, and again, this is one of our fundamental rules here, 
uh, if you will, is that we want to live by the Spirit, absolutely, but we also want to live by what? The truth, okay? So facts are very important. Facts is what is incredibly important uh, as, as close as the Messiah is getting to coming back. He's starting to bring back His facts and His truth, okay? So we want to not only serve the Lord through Spirit and spiritual things and being led by the Spirit, but the Spirit is only going to lead you into one thing ultimately, and that's going to be the truth for those that are seeking Him, okay? So we want to answer this question, are they given to just, just the Jews? So let me ask, when were the commandments given? Okay? They were given when? On Mount Sinai. Okay? Now, who were they given to? They were given to the Israelites. Okay? They were not given to the Jews. The commandments were given to God's people. They were given to all 12 tribes at the time that were called Israel. As a matter of fact, it was even beyond the 12 tribes that they were given to. They were given to all the people that came out of Egypt that chose to sojourn and to be part of the congregation of Israel. Whether you were a native born or whether you were of an Egyptian background or whether you were of a Turkish background, it didn't matter. If you were an alien, a sojourner, or a native born and you decided to be part of the children of God, then you were the ones that he was talking to on Mount Sinai. Very critical to understand because the misconception is, is that we go back to the fact that because Jesus was actually in the New Testament and he was a Jew and all of his people were Jewish, that, and they were the ones that were keeping the feast days, that it must be a Jewish holiday. Matter of fact, it's the same way today. The only people by and large that keep the commandments or the, the holy days of the Bible are who? The Jews. Now, let me submit something to you. If the Arabs were the only people that were celebrating the feast days of the Bible, what would we call them? Arab, Arab holy days, right? Why are you keeping Arab days? You know, or it doesn't really flow off the tongue like Jewish does, but in any case, we'd be calling whatever the, 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 the tribe or, or the culture of the tongue that would be keeping them. But because the Jews are the, by and large the ones that keep them, we call them Jewish. That's not accurate archaeology-wise, scientifically, or biblically, okay, so, uh, or intellectually. So we're going to dig a little deeper and find out uh, who exactly they were giving to and why. Leviticus 23.2 says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. Who's talking? God is talking, okay? So Yahweh is speaking and He says, these are my feasts. Matter of fact, when you see the term L-O-R-D there in all caps in your King James Bible or whatever Bible you got, that is a hint because that is actually the four letter, Hebrew letter, a tetragrammaton, yod He vav He in Hebrew. The yod He vav He. It is actually the proper name of God when you see that. So actually what it says is the feast of Yahweh which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. Now, why would a dad say that to his kids? Does anybody have teenagers that turn 16 and they get their license and kind of somehow they take ownership of the car real fast, right? I remember those days. And, uh, and that's because it's inbred in us uh, to do those things, to take ownership of things that aren't ours and then change them because we're ingenu and very ingenuitive, okay? We like changing and making better because God forbid that He actually made them right and perfect the first time, right? So that's what happens, and He knew, God, see, God's smarter than we are. So He knew that we were going to do this. So right up front, He makes it very clear, children, I want you to know, these are my feast. And by the way, doesn't you ever find it interesting that He doesn't call us adults? We're the children of God, okay? He's the parent, we do what he says. See, he, all from day one, he creates a, a, parent, a parental relationship so that we understand who's in charge. You want to live in my house, you play by my rules, right? Okay. Nowhere in the entire Old Testament does Yahweh refer to his feast as being Jewish. Nowhere. Okay? Doesn't happen. All right, so nowhere in the entire Old Testament does Yahweh refer to his feast as being Jewish. Matter of fact, that would be incredibly... Wrong for him to do so because how many tribes of Israel are there? There are 12. Okay? So if he says these are Jewish feasts, then what are the other 11 tribes going to do? 
They don't have to do anything. So therefore, they're not responsible to keep any of the commandments of God because they're Jewish feasts, which means that's the tribe of Judah. So the Danites go, oh, that's a pretty good idea. We can do whatever we want. Those are Jewish feasts. Can you imagine going back 3,000 years at Mount Sinai and, and, and you know, the Levites going, I told you Jews, you should have kept the law. He didn't give them to us, he gave them to you. Just ask the Christians 3,000 years from now. <laughs> They'll tell you. No, he gave them to all the children of Israel. 2 Chronicles 2.4 says this, Behold, I am building a temple for the name of Yahweh my God to dedicate it to him to burn before him sweet incense for the continual showbread, for the burnt offering mornings and evening on the Sabbaths, on the new moons, and on the set feasts of the Lord our God. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. Okay? How long did he say? Okay? And just like Bill Clinton says, it's just the definition. It depends on what the definition of is is, right? So it depends on the definition that you have for forever. Okay? So we need to be very clear and find out what does forever mean in the scriptures because right here is the crux of everything that we're going to be talking about before we actually get into the details of the feast is who they were given to and for how long. And right now we see that there's no question about it, they're given to Israel. But everybody see that? Okay, Mount Sinai, pretty obvious. And it says right here in 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 4, and it was given to Israel forever. So let's find out how forever is, if forever actually penetrates the new covenant shield because how many of us have grown up believing that the feast days the festivals the laws the commandments decrees the ordinances the instructions the manual the blueprint for living ended when the messiah came okay most all of us have, have grown up learning that so if that's the case then these shadows these shadows that we are we have been learning about have ended and they have no value or relevance to, to us today and forever then, the definition of forever, ends at the Messiah. Do you understand the logic? Okay? So he, we're going to find out what forever means. And we're going to find that by, by going to Zechariah chapter 14. Okay? So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there if you'd like, or you can read it on the slide. But the bottom line is here, the context is the Messiah has just touched down on the Mount of Olives. Does anybody know when this happens? The second coming. Okay? He comes down uh, from riding on the clouds and his feet land on the Mount of Olives and split it in two. He has just finished destroying the nations, and he's setting up shop in the New Jerusalem. And this is what he says in verse 16. He says, Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, Yahweh Almighty, to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. I just pulled one verse out of there. So this is intriguing because we have the nations celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles in the thousand-year millennial reign of the Messiah. Does everybody see that? So now we have penetrated the veil of the New Covenant. Matter of fact, we penetrated beyond the veil of when the Messiah came the first time all the way through the next 2,000 years, and we penetrated the veil of the second coming of the Messiah, you see? So the question is, is everything that we've taught about the shadows being just only a, you know, a, a part-time job, so to speak, and then they're done away with when the substance comes? If the shadows are truly done away with, then why does he bring them back in, in the millennium and not only bring them back, but create punishment, severe punishment, if, if you don't keep them? I'm going to submit that when he said they're forever, he meant that. There's very few things, let me rephrase, there's nothing that God says that isn't true. Did I say that right? I had to think through that for a second. There's nothing that He says that's not going to come true. So when He says forever, it's probably forever. Would you agree with me? So in biblical hermeneutics and interpretations, you should always err on the side of the literal. And I'm being serious. You should always err on the side of literal if it's ambiguous because the plain meaning of the text is pretty much the plain meaning of the text. 